Okay, we can get started. Uh, good morning. How many of you started your homework project? Few of you, right? Um, so for the rest of you, at least start thinking about how you would set up your program, how to set up your uh, code and stuff, right? Um, so this module synchronization is is kind of involved because you have to kind of so if you follow the the, the programming code, right? You have to think through what happens if you have multiple threads and, and and why this happens and the different solutions you have to kind of think through, right? Um, this model is kind of weird because processes and uh, once we look at after this memory and protection and uh, files are hardcore operating system kind of topic, right? This particular stuff with the synchronization, you probably would you use it in other courses where they don't actually would won't go through with it, go, go through and discuss these topics, right? It's mostly application program kind of concept, right? The OS get, only gets involved for a very small issue, that, and we'll see in a, in a few slides, where you can put, the, instead of doing a busy wait, you can do a wait or um, other, you know, put it in a, in, a, in a queue, right? But for the most part, you will feel the pain of what, what synchronization can do to your program in other courses, right? So, that's that's the that's the that that could be confusing because a lot of the stuff you know I talk about in terms of the critical section and all those things they are concepts that you look at a program you understand what they are the OS does not enforce them OS does not care if you do use critical section code and it's it's a basically application level programming stuff right so if you take for example a course on graphics and if you use a modern processor if you want your program to go twice as fast on a, on a dual processor machine, you have to use threading. And you'll face many of these synchronization issues on that course, not, not necessarily in this course, right? So I, I read that Intel has its uh, prototype chip with 80 cores on a single processor. Yeah? Um, which? Oh, it's okay. Yeah, over the weekend, in, Intel was showing off its uh, next generation research processor, which had 80 cores on a single die, right? Yeah. They're going from like two cores to 80. Cores. No, that, that's a research, research thing. So they, they believe it'll be out in, no, no, so, so it'll be out in like five to 10 years, right? Um, no, no, it's not ready for production yet. I mean, the, you know, in the hardware, there's one thing to make one chip and another thing to make millions and millions of chip at cheap cost, right? So they're not there yet to make 80 of them and sell it to you, but it's in the, it's, it's in the lab. It, it, it actually works and it actually runs, right? And they think it'll be a teraflop, right? Which is, in 96, apparently it filled the whole floor of computing, and they can put that into a single chip, right? So what, would, what you would call as a computer center in 96 would fit into your desktop, right? So that sounds awesome, right? But the, the relevance to, to the lecture today is 80 cores means that you have 80 different processor, you know, sort of processor, right? So if you use a single threaded program, you only get 180th of its performance. You, may, you can run 80, of 80 different processors, right? but if you want the whole power of that machine to come to you, you have to use Thread. I mean, that's the model we know of how to use all the stuff for a single program. So if you buy one of those processors, and five or 10 years is not that far off, right? And you want to get that much speed up, you have to use threads. And if you use threads, you run into all these problems, right? And you don't want to solve these problems by putting a lock, some of four, whatever, across the whole program, right? You want to protect as little thing as possible because one of the critical stuff is anything inside a critical section, only one thread can run at a time, right? So you, you want to keep most of your program using all the 80 cores if you, as possible, and only at the rare instance where you have to let only one thread run through, you have to do it. So you have to be critical on where, where you do the protection and all those things, right? And so that's why these are important. So you know, so. As we go to more and more cores, these, these topics are more and more important because otherwise you won't get, it, get the performance, right? <clears throat> so we left off with looking at, at, at the semaphore primitive, 
mostly because you know the, the test and set and all those things we, we looked at before are are more lower level, more lower level code that um, a normal user should not know how to use them. So we look at three higher level primitives. One is a semaphore, one is a monitor, and one is a conditional variable, right? So semaphore atomically performs those two operations. So if you do a weight, right? So semaphore is integer, semaphore s is integer. You can initialize it to some positive number, right? And weight essentially decrements it till it goes to zero. When it goes to zero, you have a little while loop there, you know, while uh, in, in, and do a no op, right? And that's called a busy loop or a spin weight. Basically, that processor is, is, is going through. So if you have multiple processors, one processor, one, one thread which is assigned to the stuff, is busy going through a simple loop, right? So it's, it's, it's using 100% of its CPU doing nothing, right? Ah, like this piece of code, right? While this particular thread is waiting, it's using 100% of a CPU and doing nothing, and, when, and we'll see how we can avoid doing this stuff, right? And signal essentially increments the, the count. So if you start the, um, if you have some large number, it's called the counting semaphore, because so, so say if you start with 10, you can go on to 10, 9, 8, 7, and so on, till it goes to zero. And if you start with the value of one, Right, it's it's it becomes a binary mutex or a lock. It, you know, only one thread can be inside that critical section. Right. So the way you may use these this code is if you have a cr critical section, right? Before you enter the critical section, you put a wait, and after you leave the critical section, you do a signal. So whenever you do a signal, right? Some other thread which is on the weight would, would get to go inside. Right. <clears throat> so, like I just mentioned before, the essentially the weight and the sum of the, the weight and the signal code is your critical section now. So essentially you're, you're moving the critical section away from your code to this implementation of how you do weight and signal. Only one thread can be inside because otherwise um, um, you have critical section problem. So essentially so when you go back to here, right, again when I mention, this is, is wasted time because you're basically looping through the stuff, right? So if you expect to be looping through them for like small number of times, like 10, 20 or sometimes, this is okay. If you're going to be learning for a while, let's say you're going to be spinning through them for a second or so, you may as well give up the CPU and let some other thread be scheduled on that pro on that particular processor, right? So depending on what this number should be, you either want to leave it as it is or give up your CPU, right? Giving up your CPU is a nice thing to do because then somebody else can can run, right? And again, we come to the point of how do we know what the what the future is? So when you come up here, if you knew you're going to be going through this for a few seconds, few cycles then this is okay, otherwise you should give up your CPU, right? And usually threads don't know how long they're going to wait and that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the tension we, we looked at before, right? Why won't you always give up, why won't you always at this point somehow give up your CPU to the machine and put your CPU to the operating system and then move yourself to a waiting state or something? I remember the process state, right? So potentially we can figure out a way to Whenever you come to this point, give up your CPU and put yourself on the ready queue. Why wouldn't you do that? Or why would you do that? Yeah. So you can get it faster, let the other process that is only the only process that's actually doing anything just hold on to the CPU until it's done so you can get it sooner? Yeah, so that's the reason why you would want to do it immediately, right? So the one reason why you want to do it immediately is you want to be nice to others, including your own other threads which can get to run, right? Why is, give me a reason why you don't want to do that. The waiting time is really short. Yeah, the waiting time is really short. Anytime you have to go out of your program to the kernel, remember you have to do the, the you don't want to go into the kernel unless you have to, right? So here, if you have to go to the kernel, then you have to do all kind of switching. You, know, you have to go from user state to kernel state, save all your state, bring other processor. 
So you have to find the balance, right? So you, you don't want to do it all the time because then you're playing nice, but you're also increasing overhead, right? <coughs> yeah, so essentially, depending on how much uh, busy time you, you do, um, you, you, you um, either do a busy loop, a, a spin, spin loop, or you have the CPU, right? And especially true if, you, if you're running on a single processor. So if you're running on a single processor, then you can prove that another thread cannot make progress because you're on the, th on the CPU, right? So in a single processor machine, you want to give the CPU to the, uh, to the kernel. On a multiprocessor machine, you could afford to do a spin, spin lock. You can afford to keep, keep going in the while loop, right? And in general, it's not a good idea to spend lots of time inside the critical section because every time you're inside a critical section, you're only using one thread, right? So if your process, if you're spending too much time inside a critical section, and if you're protecting it fine, then essentially you're running it only at the speed of one processor. So you would rather be outside the critical section as much as possible, right? <coughs> so the, the, the way to implement the semaphore with no busy waiting, with, with, with no, no, uh, no, no while loop is to call, to give the CPU. So essentially you have a, uh, a, a set of queues for each semaphore, right? So whenever a process has to wait on a, on a semaphore, it puts itself on the wait queue and then gives up the CPU, right? So, and so the, the two operations you, you require is the block and the wake up. So whenever the, the CPU comes, whenever a process comes there, it has to go through this while loop, it puts itself on the queue and blocks itself, right? And, and the CPU gets allocated to somebody else. And when, a, when the, the signal operation would wake up the next process which is waiting on the queue. Right? So you essentially have another queue and you put yourself and take yourself off this queue. So this is what you do. So if, if the value is zero, before, before you did a while you were, you're doing here, the, the, the change you do is you do a, you put yourself onto the, onto the queue, right? You add yourself to the queue, and then you call block, which essentially takes the CPU away from you. The only way you can get it back is when somebody does a wake up. I mean, when somebody does a wake up, you go through this queue, figure out which, in which, process, which thread to wake up, and then the wake up starts right from here, right? And this is a, this is a way where you don't you base the CPU and you pay the cost of doing all this stuff. So, so that, that's one primitive. So, so several four is one way to achieve a, a mutual exclusion. So if you, have, if you want to lock a piece of section to make, if there are only two threads, use a mutex, which is a binary sum of four, where the initialization is sum of four is one. If you want lots of threads to go through, and if you want that to be bounded, you can initialize the sum of four to a larger number, and use that in your programs to attain critical critical section behavior, right? The other value uh, is a condition variable. So this is gi given by the programming language. Some, some programming language actually has a construct called condition variable. So you say this is a condition variable. It has two operations which are very similar to the sum of four. Right? But this is actually part of the, the, uh, the language. Right? And you can use them for the similar kind of behavior. You know, so, um, weight will, um, depending on the value of the, the condition variable, weight would either let you go through or, or wait for the corresponding signal. Right? It's very similar to sum of four, but this is part of the programming language. Right? C doesn't support this, but there are other languages. Um, the name of the language escapes my mind, right? I think it's in your book, right? So this is part of the program language itself to give the same same kind of a behavior. Yeah? Like, would some languages even be high level enough to do, like, even all this behind the scenes? Huh. Or do you have to? So, thank you. Yeah, so you can even move high, even higher level and have the notion of monitors, right? So monitor, with the monitor, you basically say a particular um, Procedure is is a monitor, right? So d depending on the programming language, you, you, you say it different way. So for example, here if you say this is a monitor, you say anything, all the procedures within this this object are protected by this monitor, right? Which means that only one of those functions can be running at any one time, right? So once you give this keyword monitor to this object, 
then anything inside here, the system makes sure that only one of them can be running at any one time, right? And that's even more of a higher level, right? And that's supposed to even make whole life easier, right? And there is an instantiation of that in Java, right? Which is the synchronization, synchronized keyword, right? In Java, for a method, if you say synchronized, that means that is a monitor, right? So within a within an object, right? If one of the methods you have Right. How many of you use the synchronized keyword in Java? How many of you know it exists? So it, it exists, right? I mean, very few of you. So how, how did you, where did you pick up Java? In a class environment or on your own? High school. Okay. Yeah. I thought there was a, there's a, the, the second programming class was dealing with, the first one was dealing with C and C++, the second was Java, right? It was just Java. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we go through these different iterations. One, I, I think, like one year it was all Java and nobody knew C, and then it's it's the other way, right? So, so in in, in okay in Java, right? You know the Java the high level kind of stuff, right? So you create a ob you create an object, right? You specify the object, and you can you can you can specify whether it's a multi-threader or not by giving keywords here, right? And for different methods, you can specify if you say synchronized, and you say sub synchronized, right? Which means that this addition function and sub, sub you know subtraction function is synchronized, right? Since you guys do not know Java enough. I can't tell you the real. So one of the problems with, with moving it into the programming language is it's not as easy as you would like it to be, right? Because what happens is that this is how you specify it in Java, right? And it looks like it's being applied to the particular method, right? But Java actually applies the synchronized to the object to which the method belongs, right? Which means that you have a multiplication here, right? This is also synchronized, even though you don't you don't actually specify it's synchronized because it applies to the object, right? Which also means that if you created new object and you create a new ob you created two objects, if you instantiate this object twice, right? Each one of them is using a different monitor, right? So it's not actually tied to this add function. It's tied to the object to which it belongs, right? So if you instantiate two objects, then those don't share the same monitor, right? This should be similar, in, you know, the concept of you know, instantiation and all those things should be similar in C++, right? So. How many of you understood what I just said? If you didn't understand, it, it, you know, just remember that it's not as simple or as trivial as, as it looks here because if you do it under the hood, if you do it without explicitly telling you, right, you have to really understand what it is doing under the hood because these are complicated concepts, like, like we saw with the synchronous, you know, the sum of force and stuff, right? These are not trivial stuff, right? So. Just because you put the programming language sugar coating around it doesn't make it trivial, right? Um, so if you don't understand it, just 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 remember you have whether you, when you use it on on a programming language, you have to be careful on what precisely is being protected by the monitor, right? And depending on the programming language, you have to precisely understand what it's doing. And if you don't understand, then this will give you unknown results because you don't understand what it's actually doing, right? And this is true for anything, right? It's true for if, the, if something is doing, being done under the hood and you don't understand what is actually happening, you can't really use it, right? So I'll, I'll say it like, you know, once more just, just, just to be clear, right? In Java, you actually set the synchronized, which says that this is a monitor, to the method, right? You specify it to the method, 
but it actually applies to the object instantiation to which that method belongs, right? So in this case, this synchronized belongs to this object. So anything with this object would get synchronized, right? But worse, if you instantiate this object multiple times, each one of them will have their own monitor, right? So you cannot say object one slash add and object two dash add and expect these two to be mutually exclusive because they are they are part of a different different object instantiations, right? For the most part, this would be fine, but if you assume something about them, if you assume that add itself can only really be happen once, that won't be true, right? A, a good pro if you program it right, this won't affect you because this should be operating on data which is within its instantiation, so things should be fine, right? So the, the, the key to remember is there is no free lunch. I mean, you can't just because it, it looks like it's it's simple to just put monitors doesn't mean uh, it's it's easier. And we will see how how these things are done. Um, give me a reason why you another reason why you don't you won't want monitors. Can you think of reason why you would prefer semaphores over monitors? Because they're not achieving. I mean, under the hood, they're doing the same thing, right? Why would you prefer semaphores over monitors? The, the answer is in the scope of where it applies, right? When you put a monitor, you kind of make the whole, whole, whole chunk of code to be protected by the stuff, right? You don't have fine control. You basically say this whole procedure is now this whole object, uh, this whole procedure is now protected by this monitor, which means that there's only one thread going through this stuff, right? And most of the time, you would like like as little code to be protected as possible, and, and and this basically says this whole function, this whole stuff gets protected, right? So unless you are careful, you don't understand that putting a monitor is it, you know, the the cost of doing that, right? Um, and my own personal feeling is the, the the whole notion of synchronization is hard enough that you have to fully understand what it does, what the cost is to be able to protect it, right? Otherwise, I've seen code where people put the whole code within one monitor, right? And the program works fine, right? Here's a simple way to protect any code, right? <coughs> if you make a, a whole program monitor, right? You will not run into any synchronization problem, right? We don't have to worry about all the stuff we learned in the class. It basically says that your whole program is now single-threaded. Right. It solves a problem in, in some bizarre sense, um, but that's not what you want. So essentially, if you have like AD core processor, you're running on one core, right? It solves a problem. Um, it works fine. You have no no issues with synchronization, all those things. But what's the point, right? So so. But sometimes people would do that because if you're writing a small code, you just put a monitor and, and solve the problem and move on, right? You don't like specify multi-threading anyway. Mm -hmm. Would you have to even do that? You don't have to. So, what happens is, the more you abstract it away, right, the more, less people understand what's going on. So you see code where people throw synchronized somewhere, and you know they say runnable. So for the people who used um, Java, right, how many used the runnable keyword? Did you did you mean to do it? Did you understand what's going on? Or? I just use it so the program will compile. I didn't really know what it was and that, No, that that's that's that, I've seen too many too many cases like that, right? Like when you compile the code, the compiler says you should make this runnable, right? People put runnable and then make it run, right? <laughs> and as I said, that, there's nothing wrong with it, right? Right? I mean, I, I would do the same thing, right? If, if it says, like, compiler says you should put runnable, you put runnable, and then it, it, the whole thing compiles, it runs, right? Um, but when you say runnable, it, you're making it multi-threaded, right? And there's reason behind why you do that, and that's one of the reasons why I don't like this model, because the whole threading, the whole synchronization is not a trivial concept, right? With the serious implication on shared variables and stuff, 
And they try to make it simple. They make it so simple that they say, just change this and make this runnable, and your program will compile, right? And that's the wrong thing. They should basically say, go and read what this code should do and learn how to use these constructs. And people don't do that, right? And, and in that context, people say, in something will say you should make this synchronized, right? You just type synchronized and things compile, right? Yeah. So in that case, is the high level language like automatically figuring out what it can put on a different thread? You know what I mean? Like if you just put runnable, is it going to look at your code and say, okay? So you also have to like specify a little bit of what. If you make it runnable, right? And if you create two instances of the object, they are both running in parallel, okay. right? If, you, if, you, if it's runnable, it means that this can be threaded, right? Yeah. And if you call the mechanisms to create two of those objects, both of them could be running in different threads, right? Okay. And that's all the OS, I mean, that's all your Java does. It does not then go and say, you know, just because you're doing this, you are causing this other problem, right? You should make these monitors and all those things, right? Yeah, what you would really like is you give this program and then the something figures out which should be runnable, which should be synchronized, and put all the code and write code for you, right? And that's not what, what they do, right? If you say runnable, it creates as many threads as you want. And if you didn't use critical, if you didn't use any shared variables, you won't notice any difference. Okay. If you use shared variables, then you're out of luck, right? Okay. And I mean, that's, if you use shared variables, then your program will do the stuff we, we talked about when we started with this whole section, right? I mean, you'll, you'll get unpredictable results depending on uh, how many threads, right? And, and the funny part is, it will work fine for the most part on a single processor, right? Because even if you create multiple threads, there's not a whole lot which will happen, right? And it'll fail for when you go to multiple processor, right? So frequently, many of the applications, they'll, they'll say it only works on a single processor, right? because they don't know why it doesn't work on a dual processor. And, and, and the key is, in dual processor, things get assigned to different uh, threads. How many of you have faced this, this problem where things work fine on a single processor, when you go to a dual processor, things don't work? Actually, it, it's sad when you see commercial software which they say, you know, then they, then they take the, uh, the, they add it to the specification, this can only on a work, work on a single processor machine, right? You might have seen applications saying this can only work on a single processor machine because we don't know why we used a thread somewhere, but we, we did and it doesn't work anymore. So we solve it by saying it's single processor, right? Well, I was saying that happened. So would that actually solve the problem all the time? If you take a, if you take a multi-threaded uh, uh, um, solution, multi-threaded program, right, and had some um, synchronization issues, right, Something was going wrong on a, on, a, on, a, on a dual processor machine. So when you move it to a single processor machine, things seem to work fine, right? Would it always solve the problem for you? Right? Yes, the case, right? You have a multi-threaded program, right? You ran it on two processor, right? It failed. Right? And then you ran it on and one processor, right? It seems to work fine, because you know you can't prove that it'll never when you test it, this seems to work fine and this seems to fail, right? And the tendency is to say, don't do this, do it here, and you're fine. The question is, if you take a multi-threaded program with bad synchronization primitives, you know, bad use of synchronization primitives. And if you work it on the single processor, and it seems to work fine, can you guarantee that it'll always work fine? Yeah. It just—it depends on how the threads are scheduled. Mm -hmm. So no. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It depends on how it was scheduled, and it's likely that it'll go further. I mean, likely that it'll go further than here, right? But that's just being. You can play a roulette longer kind of stuff, right? Again, again, all the stuff I'm talking about, you will face it in other courses, other, other, other areas, right? I mean, this is nothing to do with operating system because as far as operating system is concerned, you wrote the code, you have bug in your code, deal with it, right? 
All the OS says, I can give you multiple threads, I can give you multiple processes, processes or, or, or what have you, right? It's up to you to use how, you know, how to use them, right? And, and that's the funny part with this whole module because it, you know, it's not clear who's responsible for it, just like uh, it's not clear who should be teaching you Java, especially um, Java with monitors and stuff. But <clears throat> so here's a, here's a, here's a um, example of using the, the monitors to, to solve the dining philosopher problem, right? Remember the dining philosopher problem where you had you know, a bunch of philosoph five philosophers sitting with a fork, uh, you know, fork or chapstick or one of those things between one of each one of them, right? And so, if you assume that you know, to the the, the the philosophers are either thinking, right, in which case they are they are doing processing, or they are hungry, right, which means that they are trying to actively look for the forks and and eating, right? When they actually have both the forks, they are eating. When they are not looking for them, they are thinking. And they're hungry when they're looking for both, right? And and this piece of code um, basically walks you through how you'd implement um, the, the the dining philosoph philosopher problem um, using monitor, right? Monitors and condition variables and all those things. So this one uses the condition variable self, right? Self is for each of the each of the philosophers. And so the, the pickup pick up, so it's a monitor, so only one, one thread can be making this decision at any one time. So you can't have two, two, um, two philosophers making decision at the same time, right? So if a, if a philosopher I, right, if they want to pick up a fork, they, they have to move to the hungry state, right? And they check to see, they, they do the test, we'll see in the next slide what that means, right? Essentially, the t test will say what what state they are, right? Test will see if they can actually pick up both the folks, right? In this, in this next code, next next page. So, if they could pick up both the folks, then they go into the the eating phase, right? If they're in the eating phase, that's fine, right? If they're not in the eating phase, you put yourself in the wait, right? You pay, you you essentially give up your CPU so somebody else can make the uh, make the stuff. Right. And put down means that you change your state from eating to uh, thinking. Basically, you give up the fork, right? And you see what both the both the people on the side are doing. And essentially, the, the, the test sees what they want, and we'll, we'll see on the next slide, right? So I, I I I give up my fork to my two neighbors on the side, and essentially let them run, right? So in the in the Test phase, you look to see if the person on my left is eating or the person on my right is eating. If they are both eating, that means the fork is used by them, right? And if they are both thinking, that means the fork is available, right? So I have to look to the person on my left to the person on my right, and if they are if they are eating, then I I don't have the fork. So if they are not eating and I'm hungry, right? Then I go to the eating phase, right? <coughs> and you start off by making everyone thinking, right? I'm gonna let, um, I'm gonna let you look through the code uh, at your leisure, but essentially you are trying to see. So think of you know if you had five threads, how we, how you would work on this, right? So essentially, you have to look at the state of what the others are doing to figure out if the fo if the folks are available. If both the people on your on your left and right are thinking, then you can take the fork. Otherwise, you have to wait for them to finish, right? So when they finish, they call thinking on you, right? In the in the, in the previous in in, in this uh, code, which lets you run, right? This is a this is a simple solution. It doesn't it, it, you know it doesn't show a lot of the issues we'll see as we move to the move further on, right? In terms of giving more predictable performance and, and so on and so forth. But this does implement the simple notion of dining philosophy. Yeah. And um, put down where you change the state of thinking. You test your left and your right neighbors, but um, you don't really do anything after that. Why is that? Oh. I change myself to thinking, right? Thinking. Yeah. Okay. So that conceptually means that I, I put on both both my f 
folks. Why do you test your neighbors after that? So you, so, so assuming that, so you, you call the thread on both your neighbors, right? So assuming that your, thre your neighbor was waiting, right? Then you do something, but if that, or, or hungry, sorry. If the, if the neighbor happens to be in hungry state, then something happens. But if the neighbor happens to be in thinking state, then you do nothing, right? You, so you look to both the sides to see what they're doing. If they're both eating, then nothing happens. If they're both thinking, nothing happens. If they're both hungry, or one of them is hungry, then you try to see, since you change yourself for thinking, right? Before you call this, you change yourself for thinking, right? So now you're thinking, they're hungry, so you check the neighbor's neighbor, and if they're both, if they're both thinking, then your neighbor can start eating, okay. right? It's a kind of convoluted code, but you essentially have to think for your neighbor kind of stuff, right? Okay. And there are many ways to implement this stuff, and this is one way to do that uh, code, right? So this is elegant in the sense that you, know, you put a monitor here, and you put few condition variables. You don't have to worry about which, which, you don't lock any of these things explicitly because it's a monitor, right? So only one thread can be doing any of this stuff, right? So, and that's why when you're inside the, the put down routine, you can call test, even though test could also be run by a neighbor, right? The, the, the test could be run by you or your neighbor, but that's okay because since they're all in the monitor, only one could be making this decision, right? Only one philosopher could, could be making the decision on what to do, and it's up to the philosopher to give up this thing. So if they don't call the wait to, um, to give up their, you know, to get out of the monitor, right? Everybody else kind of waits, right? It's elegant in the sense that you don't have to worry about these things. You don't have to worry about that. If you didn't do a monitor, then you have to make sure that before you go here, that your neighbor is also not doing this at the same time, right? So you're, you're trying to see if your neighbor should be given a CPU, but if they're also doing this at the same time, then things can go wrong. But that, those won't happen here, right? And I'll leave it up to your judgment whether that's preferable or, or not, right? And here's a you know, phenomenon we, we, we started out with, you know, the notion of a, uh, for deadlock or a starvation, we'll, we'll see um, after the after uh, uh, Friday, more into what deadlocks is and, and how we f figure out what you know how to react to it. What are the conditions which we should happen? Essentially, deadlock is where there's no possibility of making a progress. So, so if you had a, a code like this, right? If you know if the if the process zero came here, did a wait on um, S, and is trying to do a wait on Q, right? And, and this one did a wait on Q. Depending on the order this is happening. If, if S went through, and, and this is waiting for Q, and this is waiting for S, right? And they can't make progress because P1 has Q and it wants S, and P0 has S and it wants Q, right? If only they can back out, things can make progress, but otherwise, it, it's similar to the, the, the dynamic philosophy problem, right? I have the left fork, I want the right fork. You have the uh, right fork, and you want the left fork kind of thing, right? And you can't make make progress. And we'll see what are the specific conditions, why deadlock happens, and all those things. But the, but the notion is, in this case, nothing can happen because they're both deadlocked, right? And it's not the same as starvation, where you're waiting infinitely, but there is still a way for you to finish. I mean, it, it just takes longer, but you know, it, it'll finish, right? And there are. It, um, the, your book talks about some of the different synchronization prim primitives um, and, and different operating systems. Um, first, it, it's a, in a Sun Solaris operating system, and it was designed for multiprocessor uh, uh, server class machines. So it supports you know, multitasking, multithreading, um, multiprocessing. It, it supports most of the stuff that you, you can imagine. One of the Nice things they, they are pretty happy about is the notion of adaptive mutexes, right? Where depending on depending on smarts, they figure out whether you should do a spin lock or it should put it, put itself to wait, right? And that's that's their key to fame. That you can you know depending on what they believe should be the right way, they can move the process to spin lock or um, or, or put itself to wait, right? 
and they also have notions of turnstiles to um, to figure out which thread should run, be more predictable, and, and, and so on and so forth. Right. So essentially, the notion of semaphores and condition variables are are not different. The reason why you would want to spend lots of money to get Solaris or uh, enterprise class systems are they give you a lot more predictable way of figuring out which thread should run. They give you a lot more way of you know taking the decision on whether to use one one or one or the other. And if they do it right, the, the assumption is you'll pay for it to get that uh, get those features. Right? Windows XP for the most part you know was developed on a single processor, desktop kind of machine, and where you didn't have to worry about these things. So. They, you, they, they, for the most part, they disable interrupts to deal with, uh, you know, um, critical section, right? And that doesn't work when you go to a multiprocessor machine. And multiprocessor machine, they do a spin lock. Right? They don't do an adaptive spin lock. So if you, on a single processor machine, to go to a critical section, you turn off all interrupts, so no, no, nobody can interrupt you. On a multiprocessor machine, you do a spin lock, which is wasteful on CPU, but you know, not, not many people had multiprocessor machines when Windows XP came out. Right? Windows XP came out like five years back, and none of us had a, a dual processor, dual core laptops in your in your office. Right? Does any of you have the four, the quad core Intel um, desktop machine? They're 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 fairly inexpensive now, right? The the, the quad the quad core machine, right? So. You know, even now quad cores are not that that um, uncommon, and Windows XP if you run on those, it'll waste time because it's just doing a, a spin lock. Right? And it has a notion of a dispatcher object which provides condition variable like event stuff. And and the nice thing for for Windows is you you rarely write like vanilla C code. You you, you write using the Win32 API with the GUI stuff. And a lot of these lockings can happen under the hood because you, you know it's event based programming, right? Most of the, the Windows program code, you basically do, you know, if you somebody clicks on something, call this function or something, right? And so if somebody clicks on the OK, call this function, and those could be made multi-threaded fairly easily. And that's that, that, so many of these things are hidden from you, details of how, how, how these are created, right? Yeah, Linux. Um, uh, provides similar kind of stuff, you know, for, for the single processor, it disables the the interrupts. When Linux went to dual uh, multi multi processor, right? The first kernels, the first multi processor kernel for Linux, operated by locking the entire kernel whenever you had to make a system call, right? So you can you can be running on a four four processor machine, but whenever you call the kernel, it'll basically um, it will put a lock for the whole kernel, so only one processor can be process can be going through. Right? The newer kernels are are much more fine grained, so you can actually lock certain pieces of code. Right? So the newer Linux kernels are higher higher performance because when they run on a multi processor, they don't have to lock the whole kernel down to solve this problem. Right? So. And the the P-thread library, which is what you're using for your for your uh, project, it, it supports the mutex locks and condition variables, right? And it, it's available on all the, all the machines. There there are not portable um, extensions for read-write locks, right? Read-write locks are um, are the notion that many readers can be inside, only only one writer can be inside, right? So you can have n number of readers, or one writer, one or the other, right? And you can also call spin lock from within the the, the non-portable versions of pthreads, right? So that's about it for for the class today. And you'll have the exam on on Wednesday. I'm again out of town, and I, again I'll be back on Friday morning from the airport. So hopefully uh, I won't be delayed like last time. Right? I'll see you on the class. So we'll continue with the notion of deadlocks and stuff after the the exam, right? And I should be available online in chat or something. So if you have any questions before the exam, send me a chat or what have you, right? Yeah. Um, no, we'll stop right here. I forget what the what chapter six.
Six. Yeah, it'll, it'll be till here. I think 6.9 6 is the deadlock, right? And we won't have those, but we'll have till here. Is it, is it over the whole year so far, just the, from the last exam? It, it can have, I mean, I can cover the whole stuff we've covered so far, right? So anything from the previous module is fair game. It's not that, that far back, right? So.